Well, this morning, I just want to talk for the next few moments about a very important subject, which is the, the glory or the beauty of the Father. The glory and the beauty of the Father. And um, again, it's a, it's a vast subject. There are many things to be said about him. But um, this morning, I just want to cover some kind of some big picture main facts, just to kind of uh, get our minds and our hearts to surround some things about the Father and the importance uh, for our walk with the Lord to, to know the Father in a, in, in a deep and a very real way. You know, there are uh, many attributes uh, related to the character of God, and I believe that each attribute or each component of who God is, the, the, uh, uh, the, each attribute of who he is, it, it touches our hearts in a, in a specific way. It, it evokes a very specific response. And so uh, whether it is the bridegroom or the king or the judge or the master, the provider, that each attribute of the Lord, uh, it touches our hearts and it forms unique things in our hearts. And, and so even so, the, the attribute of God the Father it provokes, it stirs, it forms uh, 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 unique dynamics in our hearts and our souls as we are seeking to grow and mature in our walk with the Lord. Now, the, in, uh, uh, the, the revelation of the Father is it's absolutely uh, essential for, uh, for many reasons. Uh, one, it helps us understand uh, uh, the grace of God. It helps us understand the love of God it helps us understand the, the nature of authority. You know, that's a, a kind of a cuss word in the 21st century, but there you have it. <laughs> you know, authority, order, you know. Um, <laughs> those two words, and I, I, again, they don't get talked about often, but the revelation of the Father, it just helps us get a New Testament biblical understanding of these realities. It helps us how... how how authority works in our own personal lives, how it, uh, how it operates within the home life, how it operates within the context of the spiritual community, uh, how we interface with authority as it relates to society. And so the whole realm of order and authority, uh, the understanding of the Father when he brings us to light. Now, in, um, in, in Malachi chapter 4, the prophet, he says that, that before the Lord returns, that fathers will turn their hearts to the children and the children to the fathers. And I think that implied in that is that before the Lord's return, there's going to come a, an end time understanding and an unlocking of who the father is. Because this turning of fathers to children and children to father, I think is only possible in as much as, uh, as we understand our heavenly father. And so one of the premises of the forerunner ministry is that the Holy Spirit is going to put great emphasis on the revelation of the Father uh, to the church and through the church to the nations of the earth. Now, the subject, again, it's essential for, for, for many, many reasons. But one of the things that we're faced with um, today is that there is an increased distortion of what it means to be a father. Uh, there's an increased distortion, and I'm talking about within the culture, and in my opinion, I, um, uh, in particular in the 80s, you could see the whole sitcom culture was just slowly just began to just kind of chip away at what, uh, uh, what it means to be a father and what fathering uh, uh, means. And, and I don't think that it was just about natural fathers. I think in that it just distorted all kinds of things and even understanding uh, God as our father and who he is. And so this issue is, is absolutely essential. I think there's many things that are happening even in the culture today uh, that, are, that I think that can be traced back to the, uh, the increased deterioration uh, and as encouraged by the culture as it relates to, uh, to fathers and fathering. And then... I think within the body of Christ, I think the Lord is really wanting to uh, increase our understanding as to who it is that the Father is. It's a, it is, a, as we'll see in just a moment, it is top priority in Jesus' ministry. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why he came. It was to unveil the Father. 
Uh, for instance, the father is mentioned, you know, hinted at about 13 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he's mentioned over 300 times. That is just how, how, how vast the difference is in terms of emphasis, in terms between the Old and the New, and we'll look at that in just a few moments. So the issue of, of the revelation of the fathers could be very critical. I, I think even in our ministry, the proclamation of the gospel, to 2022, uh, 2020, there were 114 million orphans. In 2021, there's 153 million orphans. And so, this, so it's gone up by 13 million just within a year. And, and it's only going to increase. And as we're looking at, uh, at what the scripture says about the end of the age and just the shaking among the nations, that alone is just going to increase uh, the issues of orphans and fatherlessness and, and thus the need of the revelation of the father. But then also when looking at the culture, when, uh, and when, when I talk about the culture, when I, know when I think about the culture, is what I see, I, I see a harvest field, so what I see. Uh, there, there, there's, there's a harvest field, and this harvest field has got all kinds of uh, challenges and issues and confusions and all these different things. And, and there is coming, uh, a, now people are coming to the kingdom now, but there is coming that, that historic breakthrough that we're believing for. And people from that confused field, so to speak, are, gonna, are, gonna, are going to come into the kingdom of God. And there's a significant component of their confusion that can really only be fully settled by the revelation of the Father. And so understanding God as a Father is just absolutely essential. And Jesus in uh, John 17, verse 1, he says, Father, the hour has come. Now glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. That was the, uh, the mission and the vision that Jesus had as he was uh, going to the cross. Paragraph B, again, um, Jesus' primary ministry aim is to equip believers to grow in the knowledge of the Father by communicating his desire for his people, displaying his power, and proclaiming his purpose. And so when Jesus walked on the earth, that is one of the main things that he did was to, was to show the people how it is that God feels about his people, how he is committed to his people, his, his enthusiasm as father uh, for those who are his by faith also demonstrating his power and showing that he had the ability to accomplish everything that he said that he would accomplish both in our personal lives as well as in the life of the church and as it relates to the nations of the earth. And thirdly, he, Jesus showed us the, uh, his father's ways, his, his wisdom, the way that he leads and uh, the way that he uh, guides us. And, uh, and again, we see so much of that in the word of God. And but the point is, is that this was the primary focus of Jesus' ministry, I believe, was to equip us to understand um, who the Father is. And so paragraph C, so the understanding of the glory, or we can say the beauty and the majesty of the Father, it is absolutely essential for our faith, love, and our maturity. It, it, it is critical to our faith. It is critical to um, our confidence um, as individuals is to know and understand the Father and how he thinks and feels and how uh, incredibly good and kind. I, I love Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says that, you know, we're, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ. And in verse 7 he says, so that in the ages to come that the Father would display to us the richness of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. In other words, one of the great things that we're going to look forward to in the age to come is we're going to be in the presence of the most infinitely kind person you will have ever met, the Father. It's absolutely amazing. And we can, of course, uh, taste significant elements of that in this age. We don't have to wait till then. But the full unfolding, one of the reasons why the Father sent his Son to save a people was to put on display his kindness forever. It's absolutely remarkable. And so understanding the Father, it, it, uh, it gives us confidence. Uh, secondly, it causes us to grow in the understanding and the true meaning of love. Because the love of the Father is the, by which love actually is defined. We understand love, First John says. It says, it, says that, um, it says, this is love, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us 
and gave himself, uh, gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. And so the understanding of love, you know, there's a lot of talk about love um, in the church, outside the church. Uh, unfortunately, much of the love that is taught about in the church is far more influenced by the love that the culture defines as love. And this is, again, why the understanding of who the Father is is so important because, and again, we'll talk about it in just a moment, is that, that, that the plumb line of the understanding of love, the expression of love, and the definition of love comes from the Father. The other, the, the other thing is that understanding the Father is necessary to help us grow up um, in the faith, that there's much the Bible has to say about God's desire to have a people that, that, would, that, um, that are that fully express who he is. It's called a uh, Christian maturity. There was a, an, um, a preacher out in Florida who passed away not long ago. His name is Peter Lord. And he used to say that, he says, a father wants two things. He wants his children to get along and his children to grow up. And, uh, and I think that that is very true about our Heavenly Father. He really wants us to grow up. And so, which that in itself even touches on the subject of grace, because if a father wants his children to grow up, then, it, then all of a sudden the grace of God begins to take a whole different meaning other than just simply accepting us unconditionally. No, there is a requirement that comes with the grace of God to respond to it and then to grow up into all things in the Lord. You know, the bride, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the revelation of God's love is the starting point for so much. The bride cannot understand the nature of how, the bride cannot understand the nature of how much she is to be committed to Jesus without understanding how committed the Father is to Jesus. If we want to know how what level of commitment we are to have to Jesus, Jesus says, actually, then look at how my Father is committed to me, and then accordingly, and you will be empowered to, res to respond in the same way. We cannot even fully understand how much Jesus loves us until we understand the love that the Father has for the Son. And so we see in, 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 in several places where, where the love of God, the, it actually starts with the Father. It, that is the cornerstone. That's the foundation. That is the, the wellspring of our understanding of the love of God actually comes by understanding the love of the Father. Paragraph D, the, the revelation of the Father, it seems that it was the primary focus of Satan's assault against Jesus in the wilderness. Now, in, he was assaulting his identity. He says, if you are the son of God, but in that, he was directly challenging uh, the revelation of the father. He was challenging the, the father's identity. He was challenging the father's commitment and affection uh, for his son. He was questioning the father's leadership in Jesus' life when he did that. And, and so for the enemy to make that the focal point, I think it gives us some insight into how focused he is in terms of his assault against the knowledge of God, how focused he is to distort our understanding about the father and many other components that comes to the, to the realm of fatherhood. In paragraph E, in the Old Testament, law and the prophets and so forth, uh, God is seen as king, judge, bridegroom, master, and so forth. Uh, uh, about 13 times there is the mention of uh, uh, his attributes as a father, but most of the time, the revelation of the Father in the Old Testament is related to uh, God the Creator, that He created everything. Um, uh, the birthing of Israel um, as a nation and His protection and His provision for, uh, for that nation. But the issue of our direct access, experience, encounter, knowing, hearing, God, the Father, that was completely foreign uh, to the earth, and that was not made known until Jesus came to the earth. And when he came to the earth, I tell you, I mean, the numbers right now, because like I said, for, we think about it over, you know, 4,000 years or so in the Old Testament, 13 times. And then the New Testament that covers, you know, maybe about 40, 50 years, over 300 times the Father's mentioned. I mean, it was like, it was like heaven just thundered 
from above and says, I am the Father, get to know me. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is uh, ministering and, uh, and he's all of a sudden, he's, he's filled with joy and he says, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things and you've, and you've revealed them even to the simple people. And, and, it, and it, says, it says before, it says that he rejoiced in spirit. Jesus filled with great joy. He says, there was something that was hidden, Father, and now you in your perfect wisdom, you have determined to now to reveal it. Now, one of the things that was revealed is found in verse 22 is Jesus revealed who the Father was. That was the thing that was hidden from, from the prophets, even from the wisest of people, was this understanding of who the Father is. And Jesus is saying, Father, this is a glorious moment. Now is the time for me to tell the people how absolutely amazing you are. John tells us in uh, uh, John 1.18 that Jesus was the one who was uh, hidden, it says hidden in the, um, in, he, he's hidden in the bosom of the Father. And, and some of the, you know, the, the, the commentators are saying, that, are saying that when it talks about Jesus being hidden in the bosom of the Father is that it's referring to a very similar picture like we see, G, like we see John do to Jesus when he's leaning on Jesus' breast. And so the picture here is that, is that throughout all of eternity, at the, almost at the, at the divine communion table in, 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 in the ages past, the Son of God was leaning on the Father's breast, intimately acquainted with every thought and feeling of his heart. And here Jesus comes on the scene. He says, Father, now it is time for them to know what I have known all along. It is absolutely amazing. This deep internal relationship, this deep partnership between the Father and the Son. The Proverbs chapter eight uh, talks about how Jesus was always rejoicing before the Father. This, this, uh, this, uh, there's this enjoyment, this rejoicing, this delighting, or this, they, they enjoy each other and they like each other in that holy, divine way. And Jesus knows that about the Father and he comes and he, and he reveals the Father as such to Israel. He reveals the Father as such to us through the Word of God. He, he's, the, he's the God of, of infinite gladness, the Father is. He's the God of infinite pleasure, the Scripture says. He's the God of fullness of joy. Fullness of joy, filled with gladness, the Father is. It's absolutely amazing. You know, one of the challenges that I've found over the years that as I've talked with, you know, different believers over, you know, 30 years or so is that it, it is almost like, you know, we messed up on the earth and the Father is just about ready just to blow a gasket. And Jesus, who's the, who's the kind of like the, kind of like the good guy, he said, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, I got an idea. He goes, I know, I know this, I know you can get you can get low intense, so I'll tell you what. How about I go die for these people? Are you is that good? Is that a good trade? And father goes, you know, yeah, yeah, I think we can go with that. Beloved, that is not what happened. It, it was the longing and the love of the father. He initiated the conversation. He says, son, I got an idea. And, you know, because they know everything, you know, how that goes. He goes, I know what you're thinking. He goes, I know that you knew what I'm thinking, that whole thing. But, you know, but it was, but the father is the one who initiated this idea of the cross. He goes, he goes, let's go and let's suffer on behalf of these people and bring them in this infinite delight that exists between you and me. Well, it, it was the father's idea. It was the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It was the Father who so demonstrated his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is the Father who demonstrated his mercy while we were yet children of wrath. And so he's not this distant, disconnected being 
And then Jesus came up with this brilliant idea. He says, you know what? Yeah, we'll go along with that. No, beloved, he, is the, he was the initiator and the executor of his own plan through his son. Understanding God the Father is, is all-encompassing. It's, it's transcendent in nature. And I apologize for some of the, the grandeur of it, but I'm trying to connect this with the, there's something bigger going on with the revelation of the Father than simply meeting our therapeutic needs. And, and what I mean by that is that the revelation of the Father has been locked up in our counseling rooms. By the way, please keep them in the counseling room. That we, we, need, we need the Father there. But there's more to the Father than, you know, some people need that. And the rest of us kind of go on to the bigger and better things. No, beloved, it is all-encompassing. In fact, the limited therapeutic perspective of the, fa- of the Father heart of God can actually leave those with great natural fathers with great difficulty in recognizing their need for the revelation of the Father. This is something that is for all of us as believers. It is, it is all-encompassing. The Father was the climactic understanding of the apostles. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he he talks about when Jesus comes back, that everything will be subject to him. Everything is going to be brought under under Jesus' leadership. And then Paul says one of the most amazing things. He says that after everything has been brought under Jesus' leadership, then Jesus subjects himself to the Father so that God will be all in all. When it all gets summed up, beloved, in the embrace of our Father. That's what I mean by it was climactic in the minds of the apostles. It was the foremost in Jesus' mind insofar as his mission is concerned. He tells us in John 17, 26, he says, Father, here is my ministry. I told them about you. <laughs> I told them about you. I declared to them your name. But I love how he continues. He says, and I will continue to declare your name. Beloved, forever, forever, Jesus is going to talk to us about his father. I mean, a billion years from now, Jesus is going to give us nuggets about the father that will completely blow our minds. Forever he will talk about him. Ephesians 1, 17 and 19, a great prayer that we pray, probably one of the most prayed prayers in our midst, I believe is a forever prayer. Forever the Father of glory, releasing wisdom and revelation. Forever the Father of glory, uh, releasing light, increased light, even though we are in the resurrected body with the fullness of the light of God, however all that works, there's yet going to be more light. We're going to go from glory to glory even in the age to come. Of increased understanding of the Father's majesty, in particular as it pertains to how the Father feels about his Son. It is, it is as though that is the cornerstone of everything. In fact, Jesus' ministry started with the Father declaring how he feels about him. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I imagine him saying, now Father, he, now, I mean, now I imagine him saying, now son, now go tell them. Go tell them this over and over and over and then tell them this is how I feel about them and tell them this is how I want them to feel about you. Go and tell them about me. Bring them into my love and bring them into my pleasure and my delight. It's a great subject. The Father of glory, wisdom, revelation, light, taking us from glory to glory. I mean, can you imagine even in the age to come? (laughs) I mean, there will not be 
a second, a millisecond of boredom as layers of God's glory and beauty and majesty is getting unfolded to our spirit. Talk about acceleration on steroids. I mean, from life to life, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, grace upon grace, as the scripture says, it will be absolutely amazing. But beloved, here's the point. It was all the Father's idea. He didn't have to be convinced of this. This is according to his good pleasure, the Bible says. It's according to all wisdom, all prudence. He did not spare an ounce in his being to come up with this plan. According to Ephesians, when we discover the Father of glory, uh, Paul says that one of the things that gets awakened in our hearts is hope. It's this, this unrelenting confidence that there is a glorious future for us, a glorious future for us in this, in this age, and an even more glorious future in the age to come, that forever there won't be a doubt in our spirit. We will forever be filled with infinite hope and confidence about what it is that the Father has in the future. Paul says that, that we would know that as we know the Father, we will begin to discover that the Father has an inheritance, that the thing that he's after is his people. In other words, that we are near and dear to him. Forever we will know of his affections. Forever we will know of his love for us. Forever. The more we see him, you know, the, the old saying, that, you know, to, uh, to know him is to love him, right? The, the more that we see him, the more that we, uh, we experience him, we begin to know how near and dear we are to him. Thirdly, that we would know his sustaining power that comes in the resurrection, that comes from the resurrection, uh, Paul says. Page three. Again, my aim this morning is just to kind of give us a big picture broad strokes about this glorious person called God the Father. And we need the Holy Spirit's help to, uh, to reveal him in us and to us. The holy love of the Father. The, uh, the definition of his love, I believe, is significantly connected with um, his, his grandeur, uh, the, the, the eternity of God. And, and again, I, forgive me for saying this, I, I apologize for some of the language, but, it's, but we don't, you know, it's like you know, that old song that came out back in the 80s, uh, not 80s, 90s. Uh, is, uh, you know, I've made you too small in my eyes. You know, all know that song, oh Lord, forgive me, right? Be magnified. That is part of what the Lord wants to do um, in our hearts is Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 40. It says, let, uh, let, let those who love, your, let such who love your salvation continually say the Lord be magnified. That is part of what has to happen is, is the, the Lord has to be magnified in our hearts and in our thinking. Uh, uh, Psalm 50, he says, he goes, you know, he goes, I, he goes, I'm going to tell you what your problem is. You go, okay, well, that's going to be good. He goes, your problem is you think they were just alike. He goes, you think I'm like you. He goes, I'm nothing like you at all. He goes, I like you, but I'm not like you. <laughs> he goes, I really like it. He goes, I really enjoy it. He goes, but we're not the same at all. I'm completely holy other than. I'm the holy one. Revelation 4, John gets taken before the throne of God, and man, he just sees the Lord in just this brilliant splendor. I mean, it's so intense that there's four living creatures, and there's eyes all over them. And, I, you know, I don't know why all these eyes, but the only reason I can think of is because there are He's just so overwhelming to, to take it all in. So they, they needed to be fully equipped to take in the splendor of what it is that they saw. And the only response they could give was, holy, 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 beautiful, infinitely great, over and over. John says, day and night, 
night and day. They are extolling the glory and the beauty and the splendor of God the Father. That's why I love what Paul calls him in Ephesians. He calls him the father of glory. James calls him the father of lights. The father who is surrounded by infinite layers and realms of glory. He's our father. He's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we're talking about God's love, we... we, the Lord wants us to help us by the Spirit. The Spirit will help us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it's an amazing passage. It tells us that the Spirit is searching the things of God, and then the Spirit makes those things known to us. And then verse 12 tells us it's for free. It's for free. I mean, think about this. The Holy Spirit, who knows everything because he's God, is so intimately acquainted with the Father. I mean, he's just, he's just all up in there searching and acquainting and relating And then he brings who he knows about the Father. And he brings it to us. Paul tells us it's for free. All we have to do is, uh, here's a practical for you. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call out to me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3. And so the subject of the, the grandeur of God, the holiness of God is critical to understanding uh, the, the, the issue of his love because without it, we end up sentimentalizing his love. Paragraph D, to understand the Father's love, we must view it in light of his holiness. His love is entirely different than the love as defined by the culture in which we live. His love is from another realm. It's from another age. Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 says it is a love that passes knowledge, he says. Paragraph E, the focus of the Father's love. Again, it starts with his love for his, the love for his son. It's the greatest expression of love that exists. Again, there are several passages that show us the nature of how the Father feels about his son. But remember, Jesus says that as the Father Uh, loves me, so I love you. Or as the Father, later on he says, as the Father has loved me, so the Father loves you. And so a lot of these things that Jesus says about how the Father relates with him in some of these verses, beloved, they are true about us. Jesus says that because the Father loves me, he's put all things into my hands. Everything has been given to me by the Father, the the sun, the moon, the stars, the angels, the the nations, the real estate, the the planets. I mean, everything has been given to me by the Father. It all belongs to me. And then the apostle Paul comes out on the scene in Romans chapter 8, talking about the Father, and he says, what are the most, (laughs) what are the most like, is this even real? (laughs) He says, guess what? He goes, you are co-heirs with the Son of God. It's like, what? Because yes. Luke chapter 12, I love this. Jesus says, oh, little flock. He says, do not be afraid, for it is the Father's good pleasure, check this out, to give you the kingdom. You read Esther. Esther hung out with Xerxes in that whole situation over there. And when he, you know, when they had dinner and he liked the dinner so much, he says, oh, my God, this is amazing. He goes, I will give you half my kingdom. People are like, man, that's pretty generous. Daniel. Same thing. He goes, man, you interpret the writing way. He goes, this is amazing. He goes, I'll give you up to a third of my kingdom. And the heavenly father goes, he goes, all you guys are really stingy. (laughs) He goes, I give the whole thing. I will give you the kingdom. Not half of it, not a third of it, not a fourth of it, all of it. (laughs) Why? Because in the way that I love my son, I love you. And my love is displayed to him by putting all things into his hand. 1 Corinthians 3, all things are yours, Paul says. John 5.20, that the father reveals all things to his son. Many passages that talk about the father revealing things to us because he loves us. John 17, 24, that Jesus, the Father loves Jesus eternally from before the foundations of the earth. Jeremiah 31, 1, I have loved you with an everlasting love. 
and so forth. Paragraph F, the father's love for his son is the starting point of understanding the love of God. Say this again, the father's love for his son is a starting point for the understanding of the love of God. Jesus' ministry started with the father declaring his love and his pleasure over his son. The father loves us with that exact same fervor, the same enthusiasm, joy, and commitment that he has towards us. The banner over Jesus' ministry was, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Get acquainted with that. Because you get that, you get how I think and feel about you. Beloved, we are in great need of the revelation of the Father. Let's turn to page two. Sorry, page three. You know, one of the, you know, one of the amazing things about the Lord's Prayer is when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says he puts some absolutely unthinkable words in our mouth. Our Father. Beloved, that's who we're talking about this morning. He's, he's our Father. We now have privilege as sons and daughters, but once before we met Christ, we were his enemies. We were children of wrath. But because of his son and our faith in him through grace, there's a free acceptance of him in love. And we are given the power to walk worthy of that sonship. I'll say this again. The revelation of the Father helps us see that we have now received the free gift of salvation and we become his sons. But the grace of God is that there also now comes a power, the release of his power, to walk in a way that is worthy of that sonship. Romans tells us that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and that by the Spirit we can cry out, Abba. If you're born again this morning, the Spirit lives in you to awaken a cry, Abba. Another way to say it is that he's awakening a cry and a desire for relationship with the Father. It's one of the things that the Holy Spirit loves to do is to awaken that Abba in our hearts. Father, we are yours. And then secondly, the Spirit, Paul says, bears witness that we are children of God. It actually gives us the confidence that we're his. The revelation of the Father is essential for understanding the grace of God because many, in the name of love and grace, take, take a light approach to the issue of sin. Many, in the name of love and grace, take a light approach to the issue of sin. But the revelation of the Father actually brings a plumb line to our definition and understanding of the grace of God because the revelation of the Father, paragraph D, it brings the necessity of obedience front and center. I'll say this again. The revelation of the Father brings the subject of obedience front and center. Now, how many moms and dads are here? Raise your hand. How many times have you said these words? Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Listen to your father. Listen to your mom. Listen. It's the issue of obedience. In the scripture, I cannot think, again, I'm, I, can, I, can, I can see the emails now. Please bring them because, like, oh, Mr. Bickle back there, he heard Hepzibah and he kept skipping chapters. So anyway, <laughs> the, 
So I might have missed a couple of passages, but, I, but right now I cannot think of a passage where children are told to love their parents. Okay. But there's tons of passages that say, obey them, honor them. The issue of the father is about loving obedience. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, as a son honors his father, if I am father, God says, then where is my honor? <laughs> he didn't say, if I'm father, where's my love? Because if I am father, where is my honor? So I mentioned earlier, the, the revelation of the father, it, it plumb lines us when it comes to the issue of authority and order. But the thing that is so amazing about our father is that his love is just absolutely indescribable. That when we touch it, it actually awakens obedient love in our hearts. The revelation of the Father, a few more points there before we're done. It establishes the issue of identity and how he gives us royal standing to be in leadership, to be in government, or to be enthroned with his son. And we have the glorious privilege to have full access in our relationship to the Father. I love what Jesus said in John 16. He says, the day is coming, which the day is now because it's after the cross, where you will ask in my name. You won't have to ask me to ask him. You can go directly to him, and here's why. Because he loves you. <laughs> he go, he does? Yes. Well, well why? He goes, because you love me. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, many of you parents understand this. There, there is this thing that awakens in your heart when you see the way your children's friends love them. <laughs> and how that touches you. And the father goes, you know what? He goes, they love my son because I really, really like these people. What do you mean I have direct access? He goes, yeah, I'm just making this up. He goes, I don't have to be home for you to walk in and go talk to him. <laughs> you can go to him directly. Ask him anything. In fact, he'll treat you the exact same way he treats me. You're like, wow, that's amazing. Fourth point, the revelation of the Father brings in a dimension of divine discipline as he raises up sons. He brings correction, his correction and his discipline actually legitimizes our sonship. Let the worship team come up. Lastly, understanding the Father, and again, there's so much more to say, but just for today, understanding the Father gives us confidence it gives us confidence when we run in our weakness and even when we stumble in sin that we can repent and have our relationship with him restored right then and there. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Faithful, you can count on it. He will follow through on it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Can a woman forget the nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, the Lord says, yet I will not forget you. See, I've inscribed you in the palms of my hands. A good father doesn't give up on his children when they fall short. Father, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father, words truly fail to describe the glory, the beauty, the splendor of who you are. Lord, would you give us, Lord, an increased measure, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. 
in Jesus' name. Let's stand.